And so um, growing up, my mom was super involved, super involved in all of our school activities. And she was what you'd call a homeroom mom at my elementary school. And I loved it. I was such a mama's boy. I couldn't get enough of it. If she could have been my teacher first grade through senior in high school, I'd have been fine with that too. I'm not afraid to admit it. But growing up, when she was a homer mom, we had these things at my school, these harvest um, fall parties, and she would help plan. And one of the cool things about it is that we could dress up in costumes for it. And so all my friends, they were dressing up as pirates and ninjas and firefighters, these really cool costumes. And I was so excited. I'm like, okay, what's my mom going to dress me as that I can beat out all these kids? And so what she had for me was like this burlap um, robe that itched so, so bad these what I would call Jesus sandals and then I had a staff and this massive beard and so year one of these harvest parties I was Moses and you know it was cool it was I was walking around I was parting the seas everywhere I went I was holding that staff up all my friends really didn't understand who I was but I was loving it and then another year goes by and it's the fall harvest time and we're having the costume parties. I was like, okay, so I was Moses last year. I'm hoping to get something really exciting this year. Maybe I'm a Star Wars stormtrooper or a Jedi. And I asked mom, what am I gonna be for, for this party? And she goes in the closet and she pulled out the costume from the year before. And I'm like, wait a minute, mom, I was Moses last year. I can't be Moses again this year. She's like, no, 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 you're not Moses. You're gonna be Abraham this year. <laughs> and so there I go with that burlap robe, the Jesus sandals and the staff and the massive beard. And I went to school, and I was Abraham. And year three comes around. And I, I'm serious. I kid you not. Year three comes around, and I'm like, okay, for sure she's not going to do it three years in a row. And I wasn't Moses. I wasn't Abraham. This time I was Joseph. <laughs> and I had a burlap robe. I had some Jesus sandals and a staff. And literally every year of elementary school, I wore the same costume to every harvest party but she had good reasoning for it one of my favorite things about going to church was being a part of Sunday school and I loved the stories uh, that we would learn about they were so vivid stories you'd have David and Goliath picturing this massive giant and this young boy just swinging the sling around Ash and I would used to try to make our homemade slingshots just from that story you would have Peter walking on water and Jonah getting swallowed by a fish. Like these stories really had me mesmerized. They had me so excited and I would go home and that's all I'd want to talk about are all these stories. And when I started studying the word and started studying the Bible, I really got led to one of these stories that gets classified as a children's story. It's funny how there's some words in the Bible, some stories in the Bible that get that kind of classification and you kind of forget about it. You forget really what kind of meat is in that entire story. And as I started diving into it and started to study it, I really started to see there's a lot more than just what you see from the children's coloring pages. And today the story I'm gonna look at comes out of Daniel chapter three, and it's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fiery furnace. And I guarantee if you've ever had a kid that's attended any kind of Sunday school services, they've come home with the drawings, they've had the yellow and orange scribbled all over to show the fire, and you've had the the three young Hebrews in the fire and the fourth person in the flame with them, and they probably had that posted on the fridge. But as I started reading it, there's a lot more than what first meets the eye. And before we get into the word, there's two words I want to describe that really help uh, unlock some things in the scripture for me. And with the obedience series, those two words are obedience and then the opposite of, of obedience, disobedience. And so the dictionary describes obedience as compliance with an order, request, or law, or submission to another's authority. And some synonyms to keep in mind are submit, conform, comply, and this was another interesting one, on a string. And then for disobedience, the def definition is described as refusing to obey rules or someone in authority. And some synonyms for that um, are disruptive, rebellious, defy, revolt, resist. And so when you look from the outside in at the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it's obviously one of the main stories you'll read about what true obedience is and obedience to God. But as I started looking more and more and more at it, when I looked at the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I realized there was a lot of disobedience in their lives to some things. And we're going to get to that in just a minute. Um, 
But instead of reading all of Daniel 3 and reading 30 verses in a row and putting you all to sleep, let me just summarize it real quick just so you have a general picture of it. And then I'm going to break it down into um, different sections. So in Daniel 3, you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And at this time, the Israelites are in captivity um, by the Babylonian Empire under King Nebuchadnezzar. And at the end of Daniel chapter 2, um, Daniel was able to interpret a dream of King Nebuchadnezzar, and through that, he was able to help Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get a promotion um, underneath King Nebuchadnezzar. And so when chapter 3 starts, Nebuchadnezzar builds this massive golden image, and he brings everybody around it, and he orders everybody to bow down and worship this idol. And as we know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse. They choose to obey God's word, and because of that, they are ordered to face the fiery furnace. And then after getting thrown in the fiery furnace, God shows up and rescues them. And that's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as we know it. And so today, as I break it down into sections, I want to ask a few questions. And the first question I want to ask you is, who are you obedient to? Who are you obedient to? In Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 and 6, if you have your Bibles, you could turn there, read along with me. Um, Apologize, we can't have it on the screens for you. And I'm going to be reading out of the NIV version. Daniel chapter 3, 1 through 6 says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and other officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you were commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. And so this statue, this image that he built was 60 cubits high by six um, cubits wide. So basically in modern language, it's about 90 feet high by nine feet wide. It was massive. It was spectacular. It was made out of gold. And Nebuchadnezzar had to have been super proud about it because he summoned pretty much every single bigwig in the community to come around it and bow down for it. That's who all these people are, the satraps, um, prefects, governors. That's anybody that was somebody in the Babylonian um, kingdom. That's who was summoned. And including in these important people was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And with all of these important people gathered, he gives the order, bow down or die, face the fiery furnace. And so that's a pretty, uh, pretty severe threat for disobeying an order. And maybe it's just me, I don't know about y'all, but anytime I've ever been given a threat, anytime anybody's ever threatened me, my brain goes to process it one of two ways. It starts to think, okay, are they bluffing or are they telling the truth? <laughs> See, growing up, I was the baby in the family, and it's my birthright as the baby to be annoying to my older siblings. <laughs> like, any other babies in the family, you know, it's, we can't help it. It's not that we want to, we have to. It's just what we're born into. And so, Ashton being closer in age to me meant that he got the bulk of my annoyingness. We shared a room for the longest time, and I did everything I could just to make his life miserable for years and years and years. I do that thing where you put your fingers in his face, but I'm not quite touching him, and I would let him know, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. And Ashton's response would finally get to the point, he's like, you better stop or I'll punch you in the face. And so y'all know what my response was? I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. And for some reason, he never punched me in the face. I was like, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> so I knew he was bluffing. But there's someone in the Quintana household that isn't for bluffing. And I'll give you a hint. It's Pastor Jody. <laughs> and so when we were in Lexington, Kentucky, um, I'll give you a little backstory. There was a young boy by the name of Alex. And his mom had met my parents at church. And she asked him, if, hey, can you watch Alex overnight? I have to take care of some things. And I'll come back, um, meet you at the church, and I'll pick him up in the morning. Alex was about four or five years old. And so mom and dad said, yeah, we'll take care of what you need to take care of. Uh, we'll watch Alex for you. And we brought him home. And that night after Alex went to bed, the family was all around. We were watching the nightly news. And we saw that there was a gas station that was robbed right by the church. And we're like, oh, my God, that's literally down the street from the church. 
And then we see the person that was coming out in handcuffs, and it was Alex's mom. And so we started looking at each other like, I think he might be with us for a little bit of extended time. And that's what happened. He ended up staying with us for close to a year after that, um, before he was adopted by a really amazing family at our church in Kentucky. But one night we were all at the dinner table, and this was one of the first nights when Alex was there. And mom, if you're staying at her house, don't matter who you are, she's going to treat you as if you're a child. So when Alex was staying with us, she immediately took him on as a son, and she started giving him the treatment as if he was the child and she was the mother. And Alex didn't want anything to do with what my mom was cooking. And she had steak, she had peas, had potatoes, and Alex didn't want none of it. He didn't want to eat anything. And she said, Alex, you're going to eat your food or you're going to sit here all night. And Alex crossed his arms. He pushed the food to the middle of the table. He put his feet up on the chair, and he didn't want to touch it. Mom said, that's fine. You're going to sit there all night. And they had this little stalemate going. So everyone else, we ate our food. We went upstairs. I did my homework and listened to some music, played some games. I came downstairs probably three hours later. All the lights were off in the house except for in the kitchen. And there was Alex sitting at the table with his uneaten food and mom just sitting there. She acted like she didn't even care, but she was still sitting there. And so we had left. Another hour goes by. We come back, and you see this defeated Alex just cutting his food <laughs> and eating it slowly. He finally realized, like, this woman's crazy. She's going to sit here all night and make me eat it. You see, she wasn't bluffing. And the Bible actually gives us an example about King Nebuchadnezzar and if he was bluffing or not. In Jeremiah 29, 21 through 22, it says, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says about Ahab, son of Kaleah. And Zedekiah, son of Messiah, who are prophesying lies to you in my name. I will deliver them into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will put them to death before your very eyes. Because of them, all the exiles from Judah who are in Babylon will use this curse. May the Lord treat you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon burned in the fire. You see, Nebuchadnezzar, he wasn't bluffing. Burning people in the fire might have been his, albeit morbid, but it might have been his go-to execution move. And being officials in his kingdom, Shadrach, and Meshach, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were fully aware. They knew exactly what he was capable. They knew exactly what he would do. They knew when he said, if you disobey him, you're getting thrown in the fire. They knew it meant when they disobeyed him, they were getting thrown in the fire. They weren't wishful and thinking, well, maybe he'll change his mind. Maybe he'll think it's cute if we disobey him and kind of giggle about it and we can all laugh about it over a drink later. No, they knew he was completely serious about it. And so in this part in the story, this is where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego find themselves. They have a destiny-determining decision to make between obedience and disobedience. Like a lot of times we see obedience, we see disobedience, and we think they're two completely different subjects, but a lot of times they go hand in hand. You see, they could obey the king, but by default, they'd be disobeying God, or they could obey God and by default disobey the king. That was the choice they were left with. And when it comes to obedience and when it comes to being obedient to someone, you first need to understand who you're being obedient to. And King Nebuchadnezzar at this time, the Babylonian Empire was probably the most powerful kingdom in the world and he was the leader of the most powerful kingdom in the world. So on earth, in a natural sense, he was probably the most powerful person on earth. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were fully aware of how powerful and how much weight and how much authority his voice carried. But at the same time, they also knew of someone that had more power than him. They had knew of someone in heaven that had all the power in the world under his control that kind of put Nebuchadnezzar to shame. And look at Second Chronicles 20, verse 6. And said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand. And no one, no one, that includes King Nebuchadnezzar, can withstand you. Come on. And so when you look at your lives now, you might find yourself at a similar crossroads that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are at. You might have multiple voices speaking into your life. You have... Uh, earthly voices speaking into your life, and you have God's voice speaking into your life. You have voices telling you that, hey, you know what? Your marriage is kind of on the dumps now. You should end it. And you have God saying, you know what? There's restoration. There's reconciliation. You have voices speaking to you like, you know what? You were born into poverty. Your mom was in poverty. Your grandparents were in poverty. Your kids are going to be in poverty. And you have a God telling you, you know what? I'm going to be more than enough for you. That doesn't have to be your future. 
you have voices telling you you're sick, you're never going to recover, and you have a God saying, I've healed others before, and I can heal you. And you got to make the choice for yourself. Are you going to listen to those voices that speak the negativity, that speak limitations over your life, and just accept it and say, you know what, they're speaking it, they got power, I'm just going to listen to it, and that's what's going to be my life. Or are you going to pull a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and get a little bit disobedient? Remember those definitions I gave of resisting, refusing, being rebellious. You know, you can resist the lies that the enemy is speaking over your life. You can resist the limitations. You can devise some things. So you didn't think you were coming to church to learn that you got to be a little bit disobedient to be obedient. That's when I'm reading the story, that's kind of what I'm getting. And for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't the only Israelites that were in captivity. There was a lot more with them, but we only read about three that didn't bow down. So what were the other Israelites doing? They were caving in. They were falling to the pressure. And in my opinion, I think just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they prepared for this day. They prepared for this moment long before the day ever came. They were preparing. They were filling themselves in the word. So when the time came, making that decision was simple for them. They weren't going to cave in. And I got to thinking, next Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday, and you've got the Patriots and the Bears playing. I'm just kidding. Pastor Pastor told me not to do it, and I couldn't help myself. (laughs) You have the Patriots and the Saints. No, they got cheated too. I keep forgetting. Patriots and the Rams. And the teams are playing next week. They're going to fight it out to be crowned who's champion, the Patriots for the 500th time in a row or the Rams. And when I was thinking about it, like these teams aren't showing up next week playing football for the first time. They're not showing up kind of. Well, we hope it goes well. We're just going to throw some plays out there and see what happens. No, it's been something that these guys have been preparing for since last season ended. They've been working every single day. They've been training over and over and over and over again. They've been playing every single scenario out, preparing themselves. And more so than just preparing this season, these guys have been practicing since they were three and four and five and six, all through elementary school, middle school, high school, preparing for this one game, this one day. And it's the same thing that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. Before they even ever faced the fire, they were preparing for the fire. Before they even faced this difficult trial and situation, they were preparing for the situation long, long time ago, filling themselves with the word so they would be ready when the time came. They would be able to fight the lies with what? The word. See, if you think you're too good for temptations and trials, then what you're saying is you're better than Jesus because even Jesus was tempted. (laughs) And we can look at his example. He fought the temptations with what? Anytime the devil says something to him, he fought it back with the word. And that's the example we're given. When those temptations come, we fill ourselves with the word. Why? So we can fight it with the word. And the word calls us to be obedient to God using the same example that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. It didn't matter what threat was in front of them. It didn't matter that they weren't quite sure if they were going to make it out alive or not or how they were going to get out of it. But what they did know is that they were going to be obedient no matter what. So let me ask you one more time. Who were you obedient to? Go ahead, ask your neighbor, say, who are you obedient to? (laughs) And the second question I want to ask is, what are you obedient to? What are you obedient to? And Daniel 3, verse 7 says, Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples and every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Uh, so it goes through here, starts listing all of these instruments, and for whatever reason, I couldn't help but picture, have you ever seen those street musicians, it's got like a drum on the back and some cymbals, and then a harmonica, and they're playing like nine things at the same time, and every time they take a step, they got the cymbals playing. I don't care how old I get, I don't care what I'm doing, that'll never be uncool to me. I will stop whatever I'm doing and watch it, I think it's so impressive. It, that's kind of what I was picturing here, but there was just a lot of music, there was a lot of different cultures in the kingdom, so they're playing a lot of different genres of music. But the whole purpose of it was to signal when people would bow, when people would worship. So the music was intended to be loud. It was intended to make a lot of noise. That's why it had all of these different categories of music. They wanted to be able to hear it um, from miles in every which direction. And isn't it funny? The devil likes to be loud. He likes to be in your face. He likes to throw some things at you. And I was thinking, if I could just get my way and life would be so easy. Like, what if the devil, instead of being loud and in your face, what if he was just shy and timid? Like, you know, he came at Tino like, hey, Tino, I know um, I know you serve God that kicked my butt out of heaven, but if you want to, I mean, you don't have to. If you want to, I, I want you to, no, no, I'm stupid. I shouldn't even ask you. No, 
okay, okay, you want to disobey God? No, 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 just forget, forget it, forget it, forget I ever asked you, no, stop, stop, I'm done, I'm done. No, it's, it's the exact opposite. He doesn't come shy and timid like that. He's going to come screaming and roaring right at you. Look at 1 Peter 5, 8. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And I've seen a few lions at like um, at Epcot or Animal Kingdom, but unfortunately they were all sleeping every time I saw them. So I've never had the privilege to actually hear a roaring lion, but I'm pretty sure it's probably intimidating. It's probably loud. It's probably fierce. And the scripture, it uses the example of the roaring lion, not a squeaky mouse, not like my little shaking chihuahua at home, but like a roaring lion. And the devil, he thinks he's so smooth. He likes to throw things in your face, likes to remind you of some hurts, likes to throw the, the guilt and the shame, the pain, the past mistakes in your face. And he wants to make this noise to kind of drown out the voice of God. And are you letting him? Are you letting these things that the devil's throwing at you drown out what God's speaking into your life? Or are you putting in the spiritual earplugs and being disobedient to some things that are trying to take a grip on you? You realize you have a choice. You don't have to obey fear. You don't have to obey the oppression. You don't have to obey shame. You don't have to obey guilt. And you definitely don't have to obey the desires of the flesh. If Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have listened to what they were feeling on the natural, their flesh would have told them, like, hey, that fire is hot. If you want to survive, you stay as far away from the fire as you can. The fire would have told him, if you want to live, you have to disobey God. And as I started reading the word, I realized the flesh might say that, but my Bible says otherwise. So obeying the flesh means you live. Let's see what Romans 8.13 says. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Okay, opposite. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. See, for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there wasn't this massive group of Israelites all together, like, hyping each other up, like, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, we're going to disobey the king. Like, no, they had the pressure on them. They had all of their friends, all their peers, all their coworkers, everyone around them falling down and worshiping this idol, and they were left to themselves. They were left standing alone, having to make this decision, do I choose the flesh or do I choose God? Do I choose what? My mind is telling me, like, yeah, get out of there, run away. I don't want to die in the fire. Or do I listen to what God's speaking over to me? And they were alone. They didn't have anybody standing with them. It was just the three of them. And right now, wherever you're at, are you willing to stand alone? Are you willing to step out and do what's right, even if no one else is doing it? Are you willing to be the only one in your family that's standing for God? Are you willing to be the only one in your workplace that's making a stand? Are you willing to be the only one that's doing what's right? And for them, choosing the spirit over the flesh was a simple thing. They weren't rookie believers. They were full. They were full of the word. What are you doing to fill yourself? What are you doing to feed your kids the word of God? We want to train our kids. We want everything to go well. We'll teach them how not to be socially awkward, how to talk to girls, how to talk to boys. But are we teaching them how to get into the word of God? Are we teaching them how to protect themselves for when they're out there on their own and that lion's trying to devour them? Are they trained up and ready to make the right choices when you're not around holding their hand? Let's look at um, Daniel 3.16. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. And basically... This comes in response. After they defied him, they chose not to bow down, and King Nebuchadnezzar found out about it. He was willing to look the other way. He was going to sweep it under the rug. He was giving them a second chance. He's saying, you know what? I'll pretend it didn't happen. I'll make everything good. All you got to do is just bow down, and we'll pretend you can avoid the fire. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stopped him before he could even say anything more. They said, you can't give me a pros and cons list. You can't give me enough reasons why I should bow down to the idol, so we're not even going to waste our breath debating it. And we need more Christians today to step up and say that, like, it's not up for debate. It's not up for me to flirt with, should I disobey God or not? Like, no, I'm taking a stand, and there's nothing you can do to convince me otherwise. You see, the world's going to try to tell you what's right and wrong. It's going to be everywhere. It's going to be on um, videos all over the Internet and movies. They're going to pass laws. And it seems like the world can't make up their mind. They change it every day and telling you what's right and wrong. But when you open your Bible and you read the word, it's going to stay the same every single day. If it was right a thousand years ago, it's going to be right a thousand years from now. That's what the word tells me. And 
do you know the word enough to decipher between what the world's trying to tell you is right and what God's telling you is right? Do you know your word enough to know, does it line up with the word of God? Anytime um, politicians give speeches, they have people called fact checkers. And they're watching and they're just making sure, are they lying or are they telling the truth? Are they lying or are they telling the truth? When the world starts speaking, you need to start fact checking. Pull out your Bible and say, are you lying or are you telling the truth? God's given you a fact checker. Are you using it? Look up uh, Matthew 16, 26. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And the real question is, is anything that is only temporary, is it worth losing what should be forever in your life? Is a temporary feeling that might fade in five minutes, ten minutes, a year from now, a worldly possession that you might lose later on, that might get destroyed, it might rust, is it worth losing your soul over? And when I start thinking about it, I'm like, absolutely not. That's like a silly question. But so often we start flirting with things and we start entertaining things. And what we don't realize is we're really risking everything just for a little something. And is it really worth it? For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that was a big no. For them, they put their life on the line because it wasn't worth putting their eternity on the line. They said, no matter what happened today, whether we go in the fire and God shows up and saves us, that's awesome. He did a miracle. He'll show off. But whether we go in the fire and he doesn't show up right then, when it's all said and done, when the day's over, we're going to be in paradise with our God. And how many of you are willing to be that bold, to be that obedient, to cut away from the flesh, to say, I don't want the fleshly desires. I don't want what's going to ruin my eternity and say, you know what, God, no matter what, even if you don't show up right now, I'm serving you anyways. Either way, I'm going to be with you. Yeah. So let me ask you one more time. What are you obeying? Ask your neighbor. Say, what are you obeying? Ask your other one, the flesh or the spirit? The flesh or the spirit. Now, the third question I want to ask is when are you obedient? So looking back at um, a couple verses I just read, Daniel 3, 5 and Daniel 3, 7. There's a couple parts from each of them. Um, in 7, it's a response to verse 5. So verse 5, part I want to look at, it says, as soon as you hear the sound, you must fall down and worship. And in verse 7, it says, therefore... As soon as they heard the sound of the horn, they fell down in worship. And I don't know about any of you guys, but if you've ever had to deal with any kind of large group, getting everybody to do the same thing at the same time is virtually impossible. For the Quintanas, we do family game nights, and we dedicate an hour of the night just to explain the rules of the game we're about to play. <laughs> night, I'm, I'm not saying who, well, last time someone ended up in tears over the instructions of the game. I'm not calling them out. I'm not going to go there, but I'm just going to say, is that real? But we will go over probably 10, 20 times, and everyone's like, okay, we understand. We're all on the same page. We go to play, and it's like we're playing three different games. And I'm like, <laughs> like what just happened? But seriously, it is hard to get everybody to do the same thing at the same time. And here in Chapter 7, we see that uh, – when the horn played, everybody fell down in worship. They did it right on cue, right at the same time. And I remember when I was in high school, uh, one of my favorite classes was psychology. And we learned about a Russian psychologist by the name of Ivan Pavlov. And what he did was a study on dogs. And when he would give them their food, he realized their mouth would just start watering. They would see their food and their mouth was watering. And he decided, like, I wonder if I can get that same response from something else. So he brought out a bell. And he rang the bell, and the dog just stood there. Nothing happened. And he rang it again, and the dog just stood there. Nothing happened. So he tried doing them at the same time. He brought the food and rang the bell, and the dog's mouth started watering every time he would see the food. So he did this experiment over and over and over and over. Every meal, he'd ring the bell, he'd give the dog the food. He'd ring the bell, give the dog the food. And finally, after doing this for some time, he decided not to give the dog the food, and he rang the bell one time. And also the dog's mouth just started watering and watering and watering without even seeing the food. It got so trained to just hearing the bell that its mouth started watering. And as humans, we have our routines. Whether we like them or not, we still have our routines. We have our, our everyday lives. And you have your work weeks. Maybe it's a nine to five. And then you have that short time at home where you get to kind of decompress just to go to sleep and do it all again the next day. And you definitely don't want to mix your, your home and work life. 
And so you try to keep quiet at work. You just go there, do your work, do your stuff. When you get home, you definitely don't want to talk about work because you've been with those people all day long. You don't want to bring it home with you. And then Saturday comes, and you're one of two people. You either get as much done as you can on Saturday because you can't do it during your work week, or you're like me, and you just kick your legs up and you relax on Saturdays. <laughs> either way, I'm not saying one's better than the other. And then Sundays come along. You get to church, you're hanging out, you're talking to everybody, and the music starts playing, and everything gets quiet all of a sudden. You start to fill it out, see how this first song's going, seeing if the worship team brought it today. And the second second song comes, and now, okay, like I, my, oh, my hands are going up, that's okay. The third song comes, and if Chris starts hitting those high notes, you might start shedding a tear or two. You start, start really feeling it. And if the worship team does a fourth song, well, then you cross your arms and sit down. How dare them? It's not a concert. It's church. Come on. <laughs> but we get in these routines, and our worship starts to become a part of the routine. You see, we're here, we're talking, we're having conversation, but the second the music starts playing, that triggers our worship, and our worship starts going. And then after church is over, we go back to our routine. We got our Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, go through the week, and the weekend comes, because it's Sunday morning, and the music plays, and it's worship again. And then we go through the routine again the next week. And then Sunday morning comes, and the music plays, and it's worship time. But is that the only time that there's worship time in your life? Are you waiting for Sunday morning worship to trigger that worship? Are you becoming like the Pavlovian dogs when that bell rings? There, oh, there's that response when the worship music plays. What would happen if none of the instruments worked on a Sunday? Would you be able to worship? And I was thinking, living a life that's obedient to God means fully devoted, fully dedicated. And if you're giving him a fraction, if you're giving him just a small portion, that's not really showing devotion. When it comes to... Lisette and me, like, I can't get enough of her. I want to give her all my attention. But if I gave her 15 minutes of my time, and part of that was distracted, maybe checking my phone, maybe shaking hands with a few people, that was cutting into the 15 minutes. And after those 15 minutes were over, I walked away. I did the opposite of what she would want me to do. I didn't talk to her. I didn't try to entertain her in any way. I didn't even acknowledge her until the next week, and then all of a sudden I came back like, hey, I missed you, I loved you, you're the best thing ever, I'm gonna shed a tear for you, I'm gonna cry, give me a hug, I love you. And then after that, I just ignore her again, act like I don't know her, live a lifestyle that's contrary to how I act when I'm with her. That relationship would break down so quick. The same thing is with having a relationship with God, it's more than just giving him a 15 minutes, a 10 minutes here, uh, only when the music's playing. If you're giving him as a part of a ritual, as a part of a routine, then basically all that is is what we call lip service. And look what Matthew 15, 8 and 9 says about lip service. These people, I love, the Bible has everything. It, you didn't know there was literally a passage on lip service. It, it has it all. I'm serious. You should open it up, check it out. This is good stuff. Matthew 15, 8 and 9. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And if your heart's not in it, then God wants nothing to do with it. If you think worship is solely related to music, then you probably need to start studying and looking in at what worship really is. Worship doesn't start with the music. Worship starts with the heart. You can worship without a song being sung. You can worship with your actions. You can worship in so many different ways that if... For you, worship is only with the music, and it's time to do a little bit of self-reflection. It's so much more than that. Um, it's something that when you really reflect on what God has done in your life and what he's doing in your life, you can't contain yourself. It becomes a little bit spontaneous. Like, if you're not having that Monday morning praise break, like, I'm sad for you guys. What You're missing some good things in your life. Is your life that miserable that God really hasn't done anything that... It could be a Thursday afternoon and you can't help but just give him all the glory, all the honor, no matter where you're at. Give him a thank you. Have to pull your car over and praise him. I mean, there's been some times, Seti and I have been in the car and I'm like, okay, we're about to wreck. we got to pull this over because we're having our little mini praise breaks. But it's truly reflecting on who you're in a relationship. When you're in a committed relationship with God, you're not giving him part time. You're not giving him crumbs. You're not giving him the little bit. You're really devoting your entire life to him. In Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true 
and proper worship. I didn't read that you need to sing three songs on a Sunday morning. I don't have a catchy thing like Pastor says for the phone calls. I'm sorry. <laughs> he's, he's got more experience on me. But when I'm reading this, it doesn't say play the harps and that's the proper worship. It doesn't say get three singers, a drummer, and a keyboardist. It doesn't say at 10 a.m. sharp enter into worship. It says, no, give your life as a living sacrifice, dedicating your life, devoting your life. That's a proper worship. That's not just an act of worship. That is worship, is devoting your life. And as we continue into Romans 12, 2, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And when I was looking up the definition of a pattern, it says something with a reoccurring design, something that repeats over and over and over and over and over and is your worship to God, is it just that repeating ritual because your mama did it, because your papa did it, because pastor said get on your feet, because that's the only reason you're worshiping? Or is it really becoming a part of the relationship with God? And that's all he's asking for. He says, I'm all in for you. What are you going to do? Are you going to be all in for him? He's proven over and over and over that he's going to be fully committed to you. And now the ball's in your court. It, you can prove it, and it's through your actions you're going to prove it. You can say all you want. You can fool anybody. Um, you can't fool God. He knows your heart. You can make that Facebook inspirational post but live a life that's completely opposite of it. But good job. You fooled your 200 followers on Facebook, but you didn't fool God. You can fool your spouse. You can fool your family. You can fool the person sitting next to you in your pew because you got that. Well, honestly, that means nothing if it didn't start here in your heart. And that's God. That's all he wants. He wants that pure heart of worship. He wants that pure relationship. Let me look at Daniel 3, 8 through 12. And you might be saying and thinking, like, you know what? I, like, I do worship more than just on Sunday mornings. Like, I, I do have a, a heart of sacrifice for God. I, I am giving my life. I am giving myself to him. But I, I just don't know. Am I on the right path? Well, here's a great example on if your life is heading in the right direction or not. Daniel 3, 8 through 12 says, At this time, some astrologers um, or Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there were some Jews, excuse me, whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who paid no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. You see, when you're living in the world, when you're living a worldly lifestyle, when you're not stepping out in God, when you're just that, like, cool person trying to impress everybody, the world's fine with you. The world's cool with that sinner that hellion the world's fine with that rebellion but the second that you start getting your life right the second you start getting things in order the second you start saying like you know what i'm i'm tired of the old me i'm tired of that old lifestyle i'm ready to step out in obedience to god that's when you start ruffling some feathers that's when you start getting some haters that's what happened with shadrach meshach and abednego no one was calling them out for their faith before but the second they didn't bow down these people jumped out they had been peeking they had been watching they were praying and hoping that they wouldn't bow down. They were ready to jump out and get them. And the same things for you guys. The devil's just waiting. He's waiting for you to step out in faith. And he wants you to fail so badly. He wants the kingdom of God to fail so badly. But if you're stopping yourself, then he doesn't have to do anything. You're doing a, his job for him. You're stopping yourself. You're making it easy for him. But the second you start notching victories for the kingdom of heaven, the second you start getting things in order, that's when you should start getting excited. When the attacks of the enemy start coming, that's the sign that your life's heading in the right direction. Like if everything's quiet, everything's peaceful, the enemy's nowhere to be found, then you've got to start reflecting on your life saying, well, what am I doing? Like what am I doing wrong? I'm nowhere near the kingdom of God. Because if he feels like he doesn't need me to attack you, then that's a bad place to be. But when he's after you, when he's throwing everything he can at you, he's throwing every lie, every accusation, every reminder of the past he can throw at you, that means you're right there. You're close to your breakthrough. You're right next to your miracle. You're so close to being at the place that God has called you to be, that that should be enough to get you excited. That should be enough to trigger one of those spontaneous praise breaks. Come on. If you believe that, say amen. amen. And if God's put something in you, there's no one 
that can tell you that it's not good enough. There's no one that can tell you that it's just a silly dream, that you're not capable. If you start worrying about the opinions of man and what man thinks about it, then basically what you're doing is you're limiting yourself to what man can do. But when you put God's word behind you, then what you're doing is opening the doors to all of God's capabilities. See, man is so flawed, the flesh is so flawed, and you'll end up failing over and over and over and over again if that's all you're trying to appease. But if you cut out the noise, if you cut out the junk, you cut out all that stuff behind you and say, you know what, I'm fully focused on God. It's all or nothing. Like, it's all him or nothing. I don't want anything else. That's when you start to see your life launch into the next and great stages. And I want to ask you guys again, when are you obedient? Ask a neighbor. Say, when are you obedient? As a part of the ritual or a part of your lifestyle? And the fourth question I want to ask you today is where are you obedient? Where are you obedient? In Daniel 3, 16 through 23. And for any of you wondering, growing up, I would see the pastors take a drink of water. It always looked like it tasted way better than normal water. I don't know what happens. It definitely does. It's amazing. <laughs> Daniel 3, 16 through 23. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. And even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and threw them into the burning furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. And obedience and trust go hand in hand. You really can't have obedience without trust. And I remember one time being with my family, and we were in the mountains, and we went to a, um, a river that was flowing through Breckenridge, and we went fishing. Or I think it was Idaho Springs, and we went fishing. And I was probably like six or seven years old, and I was fishing. I was hoping to catch this massive rainbow trout. I'm absolutely terrible fisherman. You, if you need me to fish for you to get food to survive, then I promise you, you will not eat. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> but I was out there trying. I was doing my best. And I remember all I heard was my parents scream, Tyler, run. And so with my fishing pole on my arm, I took off running. I don't know where I was running to, but I took off running. And the, pole, the line was still in the water. And I took off running probably for like 100, 150 yards. The string was just going. And in my head, I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, so there's either a bear coming out of the woods after me. There's a mountain lion. There's something. There's a massive flood that's coming I was running from. And I finally made it to my mom and dad. And they were just laughing. I'm like, okay, so it couldn't have been that serious. What, like, what's this all about? They said, oh, we thought there was a little bee by you. And so <laughs> I went running for my life because I thought there was a bee. But you know what? I didn't question what they were saying. I trusted my parents. When they said run, I didn't look around and say, what am I running from? What it, what, is there danger? I check out for myself. They said run. I assumed there was an alien invasion. I took off running as fast as I could. But there was trust there. There was trust in that relationship. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when God told them to obey, there was trust. They trusted God. They didn't just trust him with their lives. They trusted him with their souls as well. And um, when it's all said and done, they knew one way or another they were getting a victory. The world painted it as a lose-lose situation. Either you're going to have to be disobedient to God um, or you're going to die in a fire. That didn't seem like favorable scenario for them they saw it as a win-win they said God's going to come and do a miracle or we're going to be with God it's a win-win no matter how they looked at it and when we think about it it's easy for us to be obedient when times are good I always do this thing with Brody I tell him hey Brody will you go get me a bottle of water and I would always try to time him I'm like I'm gonna count to 10 and he'll take off running I'm like oh my god I can't believe it works it's amazing <laughs> if he's watching on camera uh, mom take it away from him real quick I'm giving away my secrets but now that he's gotten a little bit older he's gotten a little bit smarter now he doesn't want to um, do things for me like that. I asked him one day, and his response to me was, you got legs? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, where, 
where did this attitude just come from? But now I have to bribe him. I say, bro, do you need to go get this for me? I said, I'll give you a dollar. And his response, he's a smart kid, he'll say, okay, show me the dollar. And the second I show him the dollar, bam, he's off. He's ready to go because he physically sees the blessing. You know, when we see the blessing, it's easier for us to be obedient. And um, when things are going good, we give God the credit. Like if a check comes in the mail, no, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> when you're driving down the road and someone cuts you off and you're able to narrowly avoid the wreck, you're catching your breath, what are you saying? Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, when that prodigal child comes back home, you're saying, thank you, Jesus. But when that prodigal child leaves home, you're saying, why, God, why? When the troubles come, you're saying, God, why is this the case? What's going on? Why? Why do we have to go through this? Look at Isaiah 43, 1 through 2. Isaiah 43, 1 through 2. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. One thing I love about God is that he's not going to lie to you. He's not going to try to sugarcoat things for you. Like he'll call it like it is. There's going to be fires you're going to have to face. Life isn't a piece of cake. There's going to be trials. There's going to be temptations. You're going to have to go through some things. And he's not saying that follow me, serve me, and life's going to be easy. I'll make all those things go away. You'll never have to face them. No, he's saying those things are going to come. But the one promise he gives you is that you're not going to have to go through it alone. You're not going to be by yourself. I'm going to be there holding your hand with you the entire time. That when you do face the trials, when you do face the fires, when you do face the raging rivers, that they're not going to overtake you. They're not going to burn you. They're not going to destroy your life. He's there holding your hand. And one of the greatest joys for me right now is being a father and being a father of Gemma. And I love watching her. love watching the things she does. And when we were at my parents' house, we were going up to my parents' room, and all the lights were off. And she walked into the room, and I was looking for the light switch. And she didn't care for the light switch. All she did was she reached her hand up, grabbed my hand. And when I grabbed her hand, she took off running into the dark, not knowing where she was going. But I said, how amazing is that? We should be doing the same exact thing Gemma's doing. We don't need to find that light switch to make sure everything is going to be safe. But we reach our hand out to God knowing when we grab his hand, it don't matter what's around the corner. It doesn't matter what's at the end of the room, what's at the end of the road. If God's on our side, I don't care what's in front of me. He's going to overcome all of that. We have a God that is greater than anything we'll ever face, and he'll help you overcome any obstacle that ever comes your way. He's not promising you that you're going to avoid it, but he's promising you that you're going to make it through it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Endure it. That's the most important word in this verse right there, endure. A lot of us wish it said avoid. We wish it read this way. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out that you can avoid it. That would be convenient. That would be nice. But it's not the case. It says endure. Now, what we want, when the fires come, we want God to pull out that spiritual fire extinguisher and just put it out before you even get close to it. We don't even want to feel the heat of the fire. We want him to reroute our GPS and take us around those. But sometimes the path God has us on is going to take you directly into that fire. And if you're trying to avoid it, what you're doing is you're pushing that down for it to come back up later. You're making it, it's not today's problem anymore, now it's tomorrow's problem. It's still a problem. You're going to have to face it at some point or another if you really want to overcome it. But when you endure something, that means you faced it. That means you've taken it on, you've met your challenge, and you outlasted it. That means you've overcome it. And so that's a huge difference between avoiding and overcoming. If you really want to defeat the things in your life, then you got to stop trying to avoid them. you got to stop trying to hide them, act like they're never going to come back around. you got to start bracing for it. Getting God on your side and saying, you know what, with God with me, there's nothing that can stand against me. Like, I'm ready to overcome this. I'm ready to endure this. I'm ready to defeat some things in my life. <clears throat> um, Daniel 3, 23 through 25. And these three men firmly tied uh, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up and thrown into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of God. 
And we get really excited with that 25th verse, uh, seeing four men in the fire. And I got excited with the 25th verse, but it was a couple words later. Unbound. You see, when they were put into the fire first, they were tied up. They were bound up. It was a little bit overkill because fire's hot. Y'all know that. I don't got to teach y'all. Y'all pass science class. Fire's hot. It's just one of those things of nature. You know it. And it didn't matter if he wouldn't have heated it up seven times. The fire was still going to be hot. The fire was still destroyed. But he heated it up to a point of overkill. Even when his soldiers got close to the door, it dropped them dead before they even went into the fire. So whether they were bound or not, whether they were fully dressed or completely naked, if he would have thrown them into the fire, the fire was going to destroy them. But he was so furious at their disobedience that they were still obeying God no matter what, that he was making sure he was doing everything he can to destroy them. And a lot of you, you're facing your fires, you're facing your trials, and you feel like it's the most unfair advantage. You feel like you got one hand tied behind your back or two hands tied behind your back, um, being bound by some things, being chained by some things. But you realize in order for them to have those things that were restraining them, in order for those things to be taken off of them, they had to face the fire. They had to get in the fire for it to remove that for them. And God's saying, when you're in your fire, when you're facing some things, he's going to flip the script. What the enemy intends for evil, what the enemy intends for harm, what the enemy intends to destroy you, what the enemy intends to hurt you with, he's going to use that to burn those things off you, to take those things from you, to remove the limitations, to remove the things that are holding you back. God's going to flip the script on the devil. There's some of you, the devil tried to use alcohol to destroy you. God will use it to teach others how to break their alcohol addiction. Some of you, you might have dealt with suicidal thoughts, and the devil thought he had victory. You might be teaching classes on helping young people overcome depression, overcome their mind. There's some of you that might have been so close to divorce, about to leave your spouse. God might have you teaching the next marriage class here. You don't know how God's going to do it, but he makes a way when there seems to be no way. What the devil tries to use to destroy lives, to destroy marriages, to destroy physical health, God uses to turn for his glory and for his good. And I'm starting to wind down. The worship team can start making their way a little bit. Psalm 66, 10 uh, says, for you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. See, I love the analogy it uses uh, as a refiner of silver. You see, uh, a silversmith, they'll take a large chunk of silver, and it'll have lots of blemishes. It'll have a lot of imperfections, a lot of impurities. And the way they get rid of those is they hold it in the fire, and they start to twist it, and they twist it, and they keep it burning. But they keep a close eye on it. They watch it the entire time it's in the fire. They don't let it go. They don't sit in there and then walk away and come back and hope it's not destroyed. No, they sit and they watch it. And as it stays in the fire, these imperfections start to disappear. These imperfections go away. These impurities, these blemishes are gone. And when they think it's time, they pull it out of the fire. And when they want to know it's done, they look at it. And if they can see the reflection, that's when it's been in the fire long enough. And the whole time you're in the fire, if you got God on your side, never think you're alone. The whole time he's there holding you. He's watching you. He's making sure that you're not going to be in there too long. He's making sure that there's some blemishes. There's some things imperfections in your life those things are just going that fire's heating those things away from you and he's just waiting as soon as your life starts to reflect him you're coming out of the fire you're going to be a walking testimony for his works and what he can do and i want to ask you are you ready for breakthrough to come to your life that didn't sound promising are you ready for breakthrough to come to your life then get ready for the fire that's how you face it. When you face the fire, you're setting the conditions for a miracle to happen in your life. But you got to be ready. You got to be willing to face it. I want to ask again, where are you obedient? In the blessings or in the fires as well? And now the last question I want to ask, why are you obedient? Why are you obedient? 1 John 5, 3. In fact, this is love for God. To keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. It simply comes down to a matter of love. Do you love God? Yes. Do you really love God? Yes. Then are you following his commands? Are you following his commands? It's as simple as that. The most powerful words in the entire third chapter are even if. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't looking for a promise. They weren't looking for a guarantee. They didn't need to know that everything was going to be okay with their physical lives. 
they love God so much that they said, you know what, I don't know what the plan is. I don't know what the bigger picture is. We're just a small pawn in this game. You're greater than anything we could ever do. But we're going to obey even if it's not favorable for us, even if it doesn't turn out the way we want it, even if we don't gain anything in this entire world because of it, we're going to obey God. That's strong. That's love. A lot of times we want to put conditions on things. We'll do it if you make this promise. We'll do it as long as I get rich from it. We'll do it as long as it turns out well for me. But God's not asking us to ask those questions. He's just saying, are you willing? Do you love me? Follow my commands. Let me play out the bigger picture. You just do what you need to do. Be a willing vessel. Be willing to be used by God and watch how the lives around you can be transformed. Watch how your life changes. Watch how your family's life changes through your obedience to God. And obedience takes action. And you all know the saying, actions speak louder than words. It's true. You can say all you want, but when rubber meets the road, when it's game time, if you do something completely different than you say, then it's all for naught. They backed up what they preached when they said they weren't going to bow down and worship the idol. You know what? They still had to walk. They still had to jump into that furnace. The Bible didn't say they were dragged and thrown in, kicking and screaming. No, they willingly walked to the furnace to jump in. They practiced what they preached. They knew exactly what the outcomes could be. They knew that the fire was real. They knew the fire was hot. They felt, they probably felt fear. They probably had a little sweat going on saying, you know what, that, that is hot. That's probably going to burn. That's probably going to hurt. But there was another fear that they had. They had a fear of betraying God. They had a fear of disappointing Father God, and that far outweighed their fear of anything natural in them. And for some of you guys, the biggest problems you're facing are so close to becoming the biggest blessings in your life. Look at Daniel 3, 27 through 30. This is how, uh, this is how the account ends. Verse 27 says, And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their, a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's commands and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree, uh, therefore I decree the people of any nation language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. For no other God can save this way. And verse 30 says, Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. What a whirlwind of a few moments going from being thrown into a fire to being promoted. I bet when their day started, they did not see a promotion happening that way at all. Um, I definitely wouldn't have thought that. But what had intended to kill them, what it was intended to destroy them, what was intended to end their lives, what was intended to make a mockery out of God's people, ended up being the launching pad for blessings, for promotions in their life. Sorry, I've got to turn back here. So right now, I just want... Everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes. I really want to reflect and think on, on your lives and think at where you're at right now at your walk with God. I understand we're all at different parts in our journeys. We're all at different parts, and we all have our different struggles, have our different battles, have those things we deal with. And maybe right now, maybe you're facing some things. Maybe there's some fires in front of you. Maybe you've been doing everything you can praying so hard that you'll never have to face that fire. Maybe you've been avoiding, maybe you've been hiding. Maybe God's put dreams inside you and you've been pushing them aside because you don't want to deal with it. You don't want to face it. You don't want to know what happens if you fail. You're too scared to face it. And maybe there's some things that have had control of your mind. Maybe things have had control over you that you hear God's word, you know God's word, but these other things, they, they keep talking to you. They keep convincing you. They keep pulling you away, pulling you astray. They keep tugging on you. And sometimes you try to be obedient, but you, you can't resist that urge. And if you're one of those people, if right now there's just something in you saying, you know what, like my relationship with God could go deeper. My relationship with God could be so much more. I could be so much more committed in my obedience to God. 
I'm ready to start being disobedient to some things of the world. I'm ready to start being disobedient to the grips the devil has on me. I want you to raise that hand to God right now. I want you to raise your hand as an act of faith saying, you know what, God? I'm ready to step out. I'm ready to be obedient to you. I'm ready to have courage and faith. I'm ready to trust you. Like there's no tomorrow. Like if today ended, Father God, the last thing I did was give all I had to you, Father God. Amen. There's so many hands up right now. You're not alone. Amen. Lord, thank you, Father God. We thank you. We thank you, Father God. And right now, I want to invite you. I want to invite my wife up as well. And we just want to say a prayer over every single one of you. And we want to really believe that what was in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that day, what was so inside of them, that feeling that no matter what happens, I might fail physically, but I'm not going to fail God. I want to pray that over all of you. And I want to open up this altar for you guys to come. And the worship team is just going to play a song and sing softly behind you. And I'm going to pray and believe with you guys that, you know, things are going to turn around, that you're going to start being able to decipher between the world and between God's voice, decipher between the lies of the enemy and between God, and be able to take control and have the courage to face your fires. So right now, Chris, would you go ahead and just sing a song? And I want to open up this altar. If that was one of you guys that raised your hand, and I promise you, you're not alone. There was a lot of hands that went up. I want to invite you down so I can say a prayer with you guys. And I'll sing.